Um, hello, members and guests. Uh, my name is Jordan Sangas, CIO at Oregon PERS and the uh, program director for Portland Chapter SIM. So Trey Blaylock is a highly respected security specialist who's uh, performed extensive work in almost every security domain for some of the world's largest corporations and governments. Uh, Trey has trained thousands of people on advanced security topics. He has managed all security aspects uh, for one of the largest financial transaction hubs, performed hundreds of penetration tests for Fortune 500 companies, and performed forensics for high profile cases. He's also specialized in uh, defending large scale systems from advanced threat to actors. And lastly, Trey currently serves on several forensic, red teaming, and penetration testing advisory boards, and also a frequent guest on television. Uh, and then lastly, he's uh, recently served as the CISO at Coinstar. So welcome, Trey. Go ahead and take it away. Cool. Thank you. Basically, I'm going to go through um, talking a lot about the changing threat landscape and then how organizations need to respond. And this is a huge topic. Uh, I'm going to go into a lot of depth in different areas. Uh, and then I'll have a larger question area at the end. So um, just be aware that that uh, will come down the pipe. Uh, we'll get to it. Uh, one thing, if you want, you can also download all these slides. I also have a link to where you can connect to me on LinkedIn and stuff like that. Um, and the barcode or the QR code and the URL are the exact same. Um, and I'll show that again at the end of this if you want. Um, the first thing I've got to go through is a little bit of background information about threat actors. And then I'm going to talk about the current changes in the threat landscape. Um, those specifically end up making a lot of changes in the way we need to defend. And then I'm going to deep dive into the ransomware threat and a little bit about APTs are sprinkled in through this whole thing. I can't spend as much time as I would like on the APT because we'd be here for probably a week. Um, but you'll get the drift of a lot of the stuff as I go through these slides. Um, then I'm going to go through a bunch of the uh, trending tactics and issues. And I'm going to talk about some of the key issues on how to respond. And when I go through that section, one of the key things that I'm uh, pointing out is that some of the way we defend now has changed from the way that we've been defending for the past 30 years. And so uh, some organizations are almost at different points in time. Some are still defending as if they were 20 years ago, some 10 years ago, some five years ago. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things that will help give the defenders a big advantage uh, when I get to that section. So again, there's a lot of information in here and a lot of slides. So I'm gonna go through a lot of this fairly quick. Uh, the first thing is there's a lot of different types of threat actors. Um, I don't list all of them here, but we are going to go a little bit deeper into this as we go through the slides. Um, the most notable one is the advanced persistent threats. Um, and then the other thing is these ransomware attackers. There is overlap over those as well as organized crime groups. And then you also get a little bit about disgruntled ex-employees, disgruntled customers. And we'll see that in the slides coming up. So just understand that that term threat actors applies to a lot of different types of people. Um, and it started a long time ago, um, you know, if, if you want to think about threat actors in general, it started thousands of years ago, but, you know, roughly 30, 40 years ago, we had uh, governments starting to hire people for espionage, accessing mainframes via modems. This was a, a very, very old thing, and it was uh, very low tech, but it became a very valuable way to start gathering information. Um, this eventually ended up turning into more formalized groups for cyber attack, uh, in addition to espionage. And then uh, it ended up becoming into very formal programs with large formal training groups and stuff like that. Now, this is a spreadsheet that you can get at the link at the bottom. It's the APT Threat Tracker. Um, this is a specific from a U.S. focus. There is a list of the U.S. groups on Wikipedia, um, but this is basically showing from a U.S. perspective of who might be attacking you. What this is basically showing you is the different groups. And if you'll notice at the very bottom, I've got China highlighted. So all of these groups are in China. The top one is the People's Liberation Army Unit 61398. We also call that APT1. So this first page is really just mapping the names. So if you hear somebody say Brown Fox or APT1, they're actually talking about the same group. Um, and it's there's just a, a mixed nomenclature that hasn't really been standardized. It's getting better. The MITRE uh, group, which I'll talk about later, is getting better about standardizing these things. But um, at first, this is what this is. 
Now that first group at the top, the uh, first row, um, that group has around 100 or 100,000 employees uh, just for attacking. Um, some of these other ones have 10 and 25,000 employees each. Um, now the US has similar groups. We have cyber warfare groups that are in branches of our military um, that are very large as well. NSA has some as well. Um, and, and these are very much similar to that in the fact that a lot of these are military groups that are focused on one set of strategic targets. They want to say like, we want to focus on the in, uh, energy sector, or we want to focus on intellectual property, or we want to focus on finance, whichever. And so basically these different groups end up getting developed to attack an industry. And the nice thing about if you're attacking one industry is it's a lot easier to really understand that target. It's easy to understand like who are all the backend services, who are all the players, what are all the standards, what are the software pieces. And it makes things like phishing emails a million times easier because you know it. Um, and sometimes these APT uh, actors end up going to the same conferences as the defenders. So if you're attacking the financial sector, you're going to go to all the big finance conferences. Um, so they end up getting very, very specialized. And that specialization gives them a lot of advanced um, focus on attacking these particular industries. Now, the PLA 61398, uh, who I just talked about, is, again, a huge group. We know exactly where they're at. That's like the building where there are offices. Um, and they've been implicated and also admitted to certain uh, attacks. So, I mean, this is one of these things that just is kind of a known thing. Um, now, Russia uh, is, their background for this is a little bit different, um, really, than all the rest of the other uh, players. Russia had a large amount of organized crime that was doing cyber warfare stuff early on. And a lot of that was getting into, you know, the precursors to ransomware and uh, stealing lots of credit cards and stuff like that. Um, and with Russia, they realized they kind of had an asset. And so their military has a blurry relationship with a lot of the organized crime groups. And this makes them a little bit different in, um, attribution. It's a little trickier to say, well, was that actually Russia government or was this this rogue group of guys? And Russia kind of enjoys and benefits from the ambiguity between those two. And it is a real issue. But again, this is just me showing you another one of the tabs of the different types of groups that you know are in that. And as you can see across the bottom, you'll see North Korea, Iran, and so forth. There's a lot of different groups. And this uh, chart also goes up and down. So you end up getting to have literally thousands of groups, uh, both military, and then you also have all these organized crime groups. Um, the more... I want to say uh, formalized group listing can be found at the MITRE ATT&CK website, which is on this page. And if you go to the top of that website on groups, you'll see this side left where it's got all these different APTs. These are the groups where there is no ambiguity because in certain cases, the group admitted, yes, we attacked some other country or whatnot. Um, so this is not as big of a list as the threat uh, actor group that I'd shown you, um, but it's still a very useful one. And it is extremely useful and well-organized uh, set of documents to correlate which groups are attacking which parts of industries and what tools they're using. And I'll talk about that a little bit deeper. Um, additionally, the history of threat actors, you know, you see it uh, mid-2006, China, Russia, and Israel started using cyber tactics. A little bit later, 2009, DOD and NSA created U.S. Cyber Command. Um, 2015, there were 134 U.S. cyber teams. It's really hard to pin down how many of these there are because, like, even... You know, Space Force has now cyber teams and there's cryptology, uh, crypto teams. There's all sorts of different teams. So it's a very, very large number and it's a moving target as far as how many different groups are actually doing this. Um, but one of the reasons for this is the importance of cyber as far as defenses around space, air, sea and land. And that um, diagram on the left is somewhat helpful for that. Now, I do have some links at the bottom if you want to learn more of this. Uh, and again, if you download the slides, there's links on all these things. Uh, but ultimately, what I wanted to point out is that basically, this whole aspect of the internet has turned the entire internet into a battlefield. And whether we like it or not, we are on that battleground. Um, and this is very uh, unfortunate in a lot of ways because, you know, it's, it's one thing when you've got all these large actors fighting large actors, but when you're all the small actors in the place, 
um, you, you end up getting into this uh, saying, there's a, a saying from Nigeria that I like is, uh, you know, it's when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. In a lot of cases, the uh, individual companies uh, fall victim to these things when they're on this playing field. So it's an unfortunate thing. So again, I'm just trying to give you a little background information as I get further into this. Um, now, a little while back, Mandiant went through and they started identifying who these threat actors groups are. Um, and back when they did this, they found 1,900 different groups. Now, you'll notice the ones that they call advanced persistent threat groups is all, are all the ones in the red on the right. They're saying that that's a very, very small number relative to the rest of the ones. So they're seeing lots of these, what do they call unconfirmed groups that are on the left, they see, you know, hundreds of them. Uh, but then they also see some financial specific ones. And the FIN specific ones are the ones that are really doing most of the ransomware. And they're basically monetizing the heck out of the system. Now, you still have some APTs that are known nation states with combination of Russia and North Korea is also another example, where they are ransomwareing people for money. Uh, but they're also a nation state. Um, this is not what we see so much from China or some of the other players, you know, be it Germany or even Iran to an extent. Well, Iran's got some mixture too. Um, but basically what you're seeing is that there's kind of a differentiation between the groups that are doing more long-term espionage and the groups that are smash and grab, try to make some money and go. Um, and this is also slightly different if they're looking at like the the warfare horizons um you know the ones that are needing money um you know that tends to be a lot closer to criminal organizations but in north korea's case it's a way of funding the rest of your cyber organizations so it's you know it's a very very useful thing for them but in any case these groups are well known they're documented by a lot of different groups this is just one of the other ways of viewing it um but i would say that typically the people that are doing the ransomware are not the people that are stealing intellectual property for like pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. Those tend to be two different types of threat actors. Um, the one I'm gonna talk about most today is gonna be around ransomware because that tends to be hitting everybody right now. Um, there's a little overlap on the defenses, but you know it, it is definitely the, the more in our face kind of threat at this time. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is um, changes in threats. The, the first thing that these um, threat actors realized is there are so many targets just waiting to be ransomware that they can't actually ransomware everything quick enough. So they've started to do cyber crime as a service uh, to scale up their business. This is no different than somebody trying to franchise their business. Um, and then they're also doing ransomware as a service. So if you have a disgruntled employee, let's say the employee was fired and they're in you know, bad financial straits and stuff, maybe they still have access or they have a friend who has access, um, they can basically pay people to ransomware your company's network. And then these companies on the back end or these uh, attack organizations will basically do the ransom. They'll actually, you know, conduct everything. They'll transfer Bitcoin. They'll launder the Bitcoin for you. They go through what's called tumblers. And then they'll pay that disgruntled employee a percentage, you know, possibly 30% of the 10 million or 50 million that they got ransomed for. So it's, it's a very um, disturbing time from a defender's perspective, just because the attackers are basically going at scale against us. Now, specifically, I need to talk about one thing that had happened. Um, one of the reasons ransomware got so bad is that uh, in August 2016, a group known as the Shadow Brokers basically stole the National Security Agency's hacking tools and then put them up for auction and later made them public. Now, these you can actually go download off of WikiLeaks right now. It's actually worthwhile to look at that. Like if you're doing security research, that's a really, really interesting uh, set of tools. Um, but likewise, we also see that in March 2017, the Vault 7 uh, hacking tools were stolen from the CIA were also leaked. Both of these are available on WikiLeaks today. So you can go get these. The thing that this did was it leveled the playing field so that suddenly all of the smaller APTs and the smaller countries and the organized crime groups basically had large you know, military grade weapons, so to speak. Um, and specifically inside of this, a lot of different vulnerabilities that ended up coming out, uh, but it also showed them different ideas 
for how to do APT and how to be a little bit more stealthy about the way you attack, how to detect like what defenses are on a system so that you don't upload any of your zero days first. It, it really gave uh, the bad guys a really you know big view of like how a large government runs cyber warfare stuff. Now with that and with the compromised Vault 7 files, there's one exploit in there uh, that is uh, called Eternal Blue. And that's at the CDE 2017-01-44 that I've got on there. That's also the Metasploit command to run that, uh, the MSF command at the top right. Uh, and I've got links at the bottom of this. And then if you go to exploit database, you can also download a couple of pieces of code that also will execute this. Now, the thing that's dangerous about Eternal Blue is it's one of the ways that an attacker, once they basically compromised one of your hosts, can go from fully compromising one of your hosts to compromising the entire Windows Active Directory domain. And that is where things start getting really dangerous from a standpoint of one, I can dump the passwords of all the admins and get the passwords in the clear. It's not the encrypted password. It's they, they get the clear password. And those passwords can be used for third-party backup services, your AWS account. It could be your, um, you know, any number of, it could be your domain administration for GoDaddy or something like that. Um, so not only does it give them that, but it gives them the ability to push out GPO uh, policies and send commands to all the systems. And this is what's allowing them to run ransomware and use the AES encryption that's built into the chips to quip, quickly encrypt all of the systems uh, that are on your network at the same time against you. Um, this is compounded by the fact that most people that do backup have their backup servers inside the same Active Directory domain. So it's also one of the first servers that gets encrypted. So when you see these companies that are paying out tons of money uh, from ransomware, it's not that they didn't have backups, it's that they lost their backups because they never thought about like, you know, what happens if I lose my entire Active Directory domain to somebody who's doing ransomware? Well, you just lost all your backup servers too. And so we see this pattern of people who are having to make these payouts is that, you know, they did think they had backup software, but they never thought about it from the standpoint of how attacks actually work. Um, so again, that particular one, uh, Eternal Blue and Mimi Cats was one of the other ones that I was talking about on the, on the bottom right. Uh, Mimi Cats also with its golden ticket and silver ticket. And that has been through rounds of uh, iterations of improvement. Uh, those two uh, different tools end up um, making it a lot easier for attackers to start getting in and taking over networks. And we see that these different APTs are leveraging that both to gain control of the network, to sniff around and you know, put themselves into other systems, but also we're seeing it for ransomware as well. Um, now, the APTs are engineering more and more powerful tools. Um, again, we occasionally do find these. Uh, sometimes attackers will get in, we'll catch them, we'll sever the connection, and we'll have a copy of part of their toolkit. Um, but if you think about it, a, a long time ago, um, we had this problem uh, where systems were getting ransomware and backdoored, or even just backdoored for sending spam. Uh, years ago, we were seeing, like, you know, 20 years ago, we'd see things like 10 million systems you know, compromised to send spam out on the internet. Um, the ability of the attackers to, to scale their operations to what in some sense seems almost as if it's, you know, Google size scaling. You know, if you've got 10 million computers under your control, that's pretty impressive. Um, their ability to scale that has been far, far ahead of the defender's ability to scale defenses across our organizations. And so this gap is what's really creating a huge problem. Um, again, increasingly powerful attackers. The attackers are frequently have better automation than the defenders. And a lot of times they can use the same tools, but they have an asymmetric advantage in that, you know, they can basically target tooling because they only have to focus on one little set of problems that we may have. Whereas a large organization, we're trying to lift all sorts of different services and email and DNS. We've got all these other different priorities pulling us in different, different directions. So attackers in a lot of ways have a lot of uh, unfair advantages. Um, and then finally, the weaponization is lightning fast. I and mean, we're already seeing the log4j weaponized and taking over networks right now. So, you know, I mean, it, it's definitely things that like when a vulnerability comes out, it takes very little time, sometimes less than an hour 
before things get weaponized and we start seeing these attacks go across all the IP4 addresses. Um, now, taking into context this point in time, we have had massive unemployment, economic hardships, easy to use crime as a surface uh, markets are popping up. We have powerful automated attack tools, easy to deploy ransomware, monetization because of crypto coins, uh, uh, Bitcoin and stuff is making this incredibly easy for these organizations to get huge. And then you top that off with years of security debt buildup. Um, this is just going wild. It is literally a perfect storm. And that's why we're seeing thousands and thousands of organizations get ransomware. Um, and again, this is still scaling up. So it's probably gonna keep getting worse before it gets better. Um, the attackers are very smart about how they're scaling their business models um, and they have a speed advantage. Um, the defenders definitely, unfortunately are not keeping up. Um, and we have so many organizations that are hurting for staff or hurting for security skills, or literally they haven't even adopted automation of their regular IT, much less for their security. And so when you're going into secure an organization and that organization doesn't have automation for their own system administration or inventory, that's a different job than securing an organization that has that kind of automation that you can leverage those tools. Um, so they, they definitely create different situations. Um, and it, it's definitely a very widespread of organization. Anybody who's worked at a couple of different companies, you know, or much less different size companies, you can see that it's like night and day how IT is administered in different places. Um, and again, it's in ransomware. I know everybody's been hearing about it and thinking about it over the past uh, few years. Um, ransomware as a service uh, is huge. There are a couple of different variety, uh, variants of ransomware as a service uh, varieties for people to install. There's a lot of different dark websites that you can sign up for these. And depending on which one somebody picks, it gives different backend actors uh, access to ransomware the network. Um, this is horrifying and ridiculously easy. I mean, the people who do this do not have to be technical at all to sign up for something like this. Um, they do occasionally get caught. I will say that. Um, we do. If your organization is set up for good incident response and you have uh, good forensics tools available, um, even things like Security Onion, you can see exactly which device got hit first. Um, and those types of things, if you're storing your logs off uh, correctly and you've got them also uh, segmented away from your Active Directory network, um, you can find this out even while you're ransomware. So you can figure out like, you know, who did this, which machine was it, what happened? And you can also go down to even say like, was it because somebody opened an email and they opened what was looked like a Word document, but was a weaponized Emotet uh, Trojan, that Emotet may have loaded up a, a different tool, you know, Cobalt Strike or something on that machine. And then from there, that person pivoted into your network. Um, but forensics wise, we can see that if people are collecting the logs, but, you know, in some sense, it doesn't matter if you just lost your entire network, you've got other problems. Um, now, last year, just ransomware trends, a lot of people aren't aware that, you know, there were 500, and this is probably two years ago, uh, 560 healthcare providers were hit with ransomware year before last. That number is growing. Um, you know, there was a little back and forth about ransomware guys saying, oh, sorry, we didn't mean to, you know, hit a hospital. And lately it's been turned around where they're like, yeah, whatever these guys are paying out. Um, we've seen multiple deaths that are related to ransomware, um, some a little more directly than indirectly. This one was from a, a woman getting redirected to another hospital because an entire hospital got ransomware. Um, we are seeing other ones where, you know, it's starting to hit a variety of different things like medical equipment um, and just it gets to be really ugly. And, and we expect this trend to get worse as well. Um, there is some stuff known, I think it's called killware, and it's where people are trying to target things that can actually kill people. Um, but it's that's not something we're seeing yet. But it's just something that we do need to worry about and take a little bit more seriously. Um, 
Now I mentioned the different affiliate programs. These are 15 of the public uh, ransomware affiliate programs that appeared in 2020. Uh, I believe there are more, but these are the major ones. Um, it, but any one of these things that gets you, it's it's horrifying because it's it's all AES-256 encrypted. You're not going to be able to decrypt it. Um, the, the ransomware attackers, the, the days of where we could go download a key off of a public site and use it and be lucky on that uh, are really slim. Uh, it's definitely changed quite a lot from where it used to be. Um, we're also seeing variants that tamper with ICS specific functionality. Um, now we haven't seen this used um, from a ransomware perspective, but we're seeing the code that's being deployed with the ransomware that's designed for this. And so it's actually got ICS controls to say, let's open up all the valves on all the chemical tanks and light the fire or whatnot. You know, they're, they're definitely trending down that path. You know, and again, the mixture of some of these are being created by APTs for weapons versus some of these are for just for money. It's, it's a blurry line anyways. We've also seen some interesting extortion. Um, so this one, if you haven't heard about it, was uh, the DC police got extorted by a ransomware group that basically got the identities of all their undercover agents and said, you know, hey, if you don't you know, pay us for our ransomware, you know, we're going to out you and say who all your undercover guys are and let that be public. And with organized crime, that could easily mean deaths for these people. So it's, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. So just, you know, understand that they have no scruples about who they ransomware or how much damage is done in the process. We're seeing the amounts of ransomware going up. Um, so the CNA financials one was $40 million. Um, and we're seeing this thing where it's blended extortion. So attackers are stealing sensitive data uh, before the ransomware the networks. The most common case of this is where they steal your email. Um, and one of the problems that we have is like increasingly, if you're doing forensics or incident response, increasingly people don't own their own mail servers. They're outsourcing their mail servers to Microsoft and Google. And if you don't control your mail servers, you don't necessarily get to see when a copy of all that email goes out the door. Um, and that creates some different problems from an incident response perspective. Whereas if you have those servers on site, you'll see the network traffic spike up and you'll see that server, like maybe it's drives or the number of records, records per second getting pulled from the database. You've got a moment where you can say, hey, all of our emails should not be flying out the door. This server shouldn't be sending terabytes of data out. Let's shut it off. Um, so increasingly, we can't even see this in organizations, especially if it's getting stolen from a third-party network that doesn't have any way for us to control that. Um, but what they're doing is they've got sets of keywords they're looking for, and it can be looking for everything from cheating spouses that are executives of the company. They can look for drugs. They can look for crimes or things that were never reported for regulatory concern. Anything that can give them some kind of dirt to say like, okay, so you, we ransomware you and you said you're not going to pay because you've got backups. Well, we've also got all this data on you. And so if you don't pay us, we're going to release all this. We're going to release all your customers' medical records or any number of things. And this combination one-two punch is how they're getting away from people who say, we don't want to pay because we've got backups. And so and it's become an effective tactic. And it's also kind of become the norm. So when we find a company that's been ransomware, you know, I would say probably a third of the time it was like somebody clicked an email and it instantly went and ripped through the network. And those tend to be the thin organizations, but the APT organizations, they'll be a little bit sneakier and sit around for about a month, set up a lot of back doors, uh, possibly on your printers, the uh, printer attack tool uh, framework, um, and basically give themselves back doors. So even after you clean up this event, three to six months later, it'll pop them a new shell and they'll be able to get back into your network. Um, so again, there's a difference in the types of attackers that do this, but the ones that are doing this blended extortion, um, they're sneaking around on a lot of your networks and frequently also looking for applications that have uh, connections to your suppliers. So if they can see, I've got SSH keys or API keys um, to one of your suppliers, one of your business partners, they'll steal those before they go out the door and then they'll attack that customer next. So, and that's something we've also seen that's uh, another unfortunate uh, setup. 
Now, this is the, um, the Department of Justice last year realized that this has gotten so out of hand that they ended up creating their own group to handle uh, ransomware and extortion. Um, likewise, we've seen executive orders to the president about dealing with ransomware. Ransomware is literally getting out of control. Um, there's a group that got together to get 60 uh, industry experts to kind of come up with like, what is the best role for government? Uh, to work on this. And this is kind of an interesting report, but it's basically recommendations for governments around the world, uh, what they can do to start fighting some of these problems with ransomware. Um, but again, right now, we don't see any end in sight on this stuff. Um, it is definitely a huge problem. Now, this is uh, from one of my, I guess, customers for my business, where they had an, a situation where they got ransomware and I got pulled in afterwards. And this is me showing you what these portals look like. And so when you see this, there's, you'll notice there's three tabs at the bottom. There's the About Us chat support and instructions. So the About Us is kind of a reputation system. And this is works to the attacker's advantage because if they see that like, you know, this uh, Sotonovinki, I can't pronounce it, uh, group has, you know, ransomware, 10,000 companies. And, but, you know, if you pay, they tend to give you the keys, they get a good reputation. It it increases the likelihood that you'll pay if you're in pain. Um, but one of the things that they do that's interesting is that chat support, um, they'll go through your email and they'll look for to see if you have a cyber insurance policy. If that was in some of your emails, they'll take a copy of that policy and put it out there and say like, you've got a $5 million policy. We want 4.9999. Um, you know, they'll put that kind of information, they'll put keys, they'll put photos, anything that they can blackmail you. The second you go to this web page, it's basically they'll give you a tour link, with a, which is a dot onion uh, link. When you click on that, you'll see this information that they had already gathered before they set up this website, before they ransomware your network. Um, and this is how you kind of end up going through this and seeing that. Now, I've got a lot of different resources. Uh, if you go to this, this is also uh, a link if you go to that um, URL at the end of this or through the QR code. Um, but this is if you just go to ransomware.html. This has got a lot of different resources for tools, how to check things. I've got some information about ransomware negotiation, like a lot of different things that could be useful for dealing with that if you ever run into it. Uh, hey, Trey, this, um, yeah. Yeah, Trey, this is Jordan. Um, we do have a question in chat. Uh, if we would mind taking a quick break yeah, and answering. Yeah. So if you look at it, uh, the real world effect for many of our business comes down to the ability to insure, insure against attacks like you described. If you are providing insurance to organizations, what would be some of the key elements you would need to see as primary defense? And then he also has a, a follow-up question oh. after that. Yeah. Um... It's, yeah, it's, it's, that's a loaded question in a way. Um, the biggest thing that I would tell you is you want to have completed an active directory security assessment if it's a large Microsoft network. Now, that doesn't cover everything. Um, there are Linux-specific ransomware. They're, they're very rare compared to the, the Microsoft ones. But making sure that somebody who has the right skills has analyzed your active directory uh, environment or done a ransomware pre-assessment. That's it's one of the things that I've been doing a lot for like nonprofits is like going and showing them like these are where your all your vulnerabilities are from from a ransomware specific package and also making sure people have the ability to follow up and communicate. But the biggest one is that Active Directory component because there are so many problems with Active Directory. And unfortunately, it, just an older method of dealing with security, like 15 years ago, we thought if it was patched, you were good. And that's not true at all by the longest shot you could imagine with Active Directory. So having your servers completely patched is effectively nothing for Active Directory. And unfortunately, Active Directory is this method where we're losing all these different systems. So if you want to find somebody who's doing really good work, you would look at how, how much work they've done from securing that. Um, after that, you look at like two-factor authentication, making sure that they've got that everywhere. And then you start looking at like external penetration assessments, um, just because there's a lot of different ways people can get in. Um, but the big one would be the Active Directory one. Um, and was there another part of that question? I kind of may have gone off on a tangent. Yeah, he's, yeah Jeremy also followed up another question. Uh, smaller insurance providers are giving up on cyber insurance and running for the hills. Others are just making premiums unreachable. What is the best hope for balance? 
Yeah. So this is going from two different directions. You get the largest companies in the world are switching to self-insurance. You know, so like if you're worried about getting, you know, a hundred million dollar ransomware or whatnot, um, the, the model for a lot of this stuff, if you're a giant company is to switch a little bit towards self-insurance um, and then small insurance providers, they're in a problem. They're in a, a real bind because they don't have the ability to assess the customer correctly. Um, some of the large, I've worked with a lot of different insurance companies. Some of the larger insurance companies are spending more time assessing the CISO skill set and assessing the uh, health of the network and looking at technical tests and then looking at the long-term uh, health of their external facing systems through sites like census, C-E-N-S-Y-S.io, census.io. They take a snapshot of the entire IP4 internet for like the last 11 years. And so you can see like when they got a new CISO or they got a new head of IT, did security get better or worse? You can go look and, you know, kind of correlate that to LinkedIn if you want. Um, but so there, there are ways, I think the insurers are in a real bad bind if you can't figure out who the best like 40% of people are. Now, this isn't to say that, you know, large companies are better than small companies or medium or any of that. Um, and I find that that doesn't really have anything to do with security. Um, in fact, actually, companies that spend a fortune on security can have horrible security because they just don't do some of the basics. Um, and then I've, on the converse, I've seen little bitty smart uh, startups that were really, really smart about the way they did things and had almost zero attack surface. And it would be really, really hard to attack. Um, you know, but I, I think that what it comes down to is for an insurance provider, how are you evaluating the risks that are involved in these organizations? And is the way you're analyzing those uh, risks up to date? Because one of the problems that I see with a lot of these insurance providers, they're asking questions from 20 years ago. Like 20 years ago, we asked a certain set of questions and then that created like the bits assessment, all these other different assessment methodologies. And it's not that those weren't bad ideas, but they aren't relevant at all to ransomware. And when you get to the ransomware, like the heart of the issue of ransomware, if, you're, if that's your biggest concern from an insurance provider, your questions should be oriented towards ransomware security, not general high level 20 year old security. So I, I find that that's the biggest difference. And when I work with companies, including insurance companies, I kind of get a sense of like, where are they in the sense of time? Are they like 30 years behind, 10 years behind? You know, and you'll hear me phrase that a lot, but it, 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 with a lot of security products, it's the same thing. You know, a lot of security tools that you may buy don't understand threat intelligence. They don't understand how to use that. They don't understand like the MITRE attack framework, and they've probably never heard of the MITRE defense framework, framework or the defend framework that has a three in it. Um, so yeah, it's 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 tricky. Um, you know, and I, I think that that industry will get better. Right now, I think a lot of the insurers wrote policies that they can't cover and they're getting beaten up left and right on these ransomware payouts. Um, and then we're seeing that also match with the courts. So there's a lot of lawsuits where these are going to court. Um, and I think I'll talk about that later in the slides, but uh, there, there's a lot of issues. It's, it's something I could also talk about for days. Um, and there's little holes. Oh, and one thing I'll mention, and I, I hope I have this in the slides, but uh, the FTC also has a way, they have a checklist for checking your cyber insurance policy. And it has kind of like the 10 main things you need to check for in those. Um, but you also wanna check for a warfare clause because some of these APTs are being designated like, well, that's North Korea's military. So since it's that we treat it as warfare, we're not gonna pay. Um, so the balance between being a customer and the insurance provider needs to be a little bit more clear. Um, but likewise, you know, I mean, I, I would be, if I were an insurance company, there's a lot of companies I wouldn't want to insure too, because there's some bad companies. There's some companies that are not doing security well, I'll say that. So, I, and again, I could talk about this for days, but hopefully that answers your question. Hey, go ahead and continue on, Trey. Uh, there is another question, but we'll leave it at towards the end. Okay. Sounds Thanks. good. Um, so this slide is basically showing you in terms of a MITRE attack surface, the number one ways that ransomware is coming into your organization. 
Um, I can't spend a ton of time talking about MITRE, but it's a wonderful framework. But the thing that this does is you have all these different pieces of security that we deal with. And like, if you look at that top uh, row where it says initial access, what this is basically telling you is that the initial access for most ransomware is coming in through these five areas. So these are the five areas you need to secure first from a ransomware defense perspective. And this kind of lets you go through and figure out like, what do I need to prioritize? Assuming that ransomware is my biggest threat. And for a lot of organizations, but not all, for a lot of organizations, ransomware it could potentially be the most impactful thing to their business, especially given the average downtime is nine days. So, like if you're your network, you know, it's like, okay, we just got ransomware. We want to pay it five minutes later, nine days of you know negotiating. It's you're gonna spend two days just getting the setup to be able to pay in ransomware or to pay in uh, Bitcoin or Monero. Um, the, the process is long, there's some negotiation. Um so yeah, it's uh, it's not necessarily a fun process, but the when uh, companies look at doing risk matrices of what will damage them the most, ransomware by far is the most impactful, and it's also typically the most likely, just because so many businesses are getting hit by it right now. So if you know that those are your hot, you know, your number one uh, attack concern, it makes sense to match your defenses to that particular thing or to prioritize these first. Um, again more stuff out on that uh, website that I've got. Um, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, this is the attack matrix uh, for enterprise. Um, this is uh, this gets updated all the time. I just wanted to kind of show you that on the left, you have this column for reconnaissance, and then we go into resource development, initial access. These actually pull into a uh, drop-down menu, so there's multiple ways that these things end up happening. Uh, for example, you might have phishing via email, but you might have SMS uh, smishing uh, via text message. There's lots of different ways people come in and attack via Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and, and one of the problems that we have is like people working on their laptops will check their personal email. They will check their social media accounts, even though they probably shouldn't be doing it. Uh, it does happen. And when that happens, that can be a really good vector for an attacker to get on one of your corporate assets. So again, from left to right, this kind of shows the timeline that the way that this works. And at the end, this is like where, you know, once they've got everything in control, this is what ends up happening. Now, in this example, one of the things I'm showing you here is I'm this is a highlight of the tools known by this one attacker, APT41, because it turns out like these attackers don't use all these different methods. They find what methods work best for them, and that ends up creating a little blueprint. And these, what you see highlighted in blue is everything that we know that that APT does when they're spear phishing to do ransomware. Now, what I've done is drawn in on here, and this, the, what, what I'm showing you is that APT41 does a spear phishing attachment. They do a couple of different things to get on control of a machine, and you'll see a mixture of password cracking, key logging, or dumping the AD uh, admin credentials. But once they get that, once they get one of those admin credentials, then it jumps over to ransomwareing the entire network. Now, what's nice about this is this MITRE attack framework allows you to say, well, if the initial access is always one of these two and this APT is attacking our industry specifically, then this is where we need to start our security or vice versa. You know, maybe we've got that taken care of. We want to get a little further down the path. Um, it shows you places that you can prioritize. Um, and again, this is just showing you mapping that back. That's just for that one APT. There's a lot of different APTs and they behave differently. This sheet also, uh, which you can download or access for free, um, it's a Google Doc. I definitely recommend checking it out. It also lists who the targets are. And so if you go through this list, you'll see like all these APTs. So like China has like 50 APTs, but there's only like four that are tracking financial institutions. And so if you're a financial institution, you want to pay a lot of attention to who those four are and then go look at the maps that look like this for those four attackers. And you'll see that there's a lot of overlap. And those are the places you want to start defending first. So, so it's a really, really useful tool. Again, I can talk for days about ransomware. It's uh, one of the main things I focus on. Um, um, so as far as COVID-19 uh, is concerned, one of the biggest things is we've changed a lot of our attack surfaces in the last 
two to three years. Uh, and, and the biggest key area is everybody went home and started working remote. And uh, we started having to basically throw everybody in VPNs. Um, but it changed the way we would have secured a call center, for example, or the tools that we would have had uh, monitoring the network. And, and right now, it's much easier for attackers to attack companies than it was before, because we basically had um, a lot of our assets were under our control in physical areas. And now that it's opened up and everybody's got a VPN connection, it's a lot easier for people to get on a call center workers uh, system or sales engineer uh, system and then use that in that VPN connection to get in. Now, there are ways, and I've got a note down here on the bottom about VPN groups. One problem we ran into is nobody set up all these VPN groups. They typically had like one to four, uh, most commonly one. So it was like VPN or not VPN. Um, but you sometimes had a couple of VPN groups for executives, admins, and that was it. Um, what ends up happening is where we used to would have had a call center or different floors sectioned off for different groups of people. And maybe we had a research group that had special intellectual property. And we, we secured that with the building and having a separate physical network. When we put everybody on VPN at the same time, all of the segmentation that happened internally all just got blown away from us people. And so what ended up happening is some of the call center workers or whatever suddenly had access to these research areas that before they were given VPN access, they never had access to it. Um, this could have been prevented, um, but the, the key thing here is those VPN groups, because that VPN groups and that firewalling is what creates that segmentation, and that uniformly is something that was not handled well when everybody just started randomly, you know, working from home for the first time. Um, we did see some companies that had that plan, but uh, in general, it was a, a big problem. Um, so the other thing is, you know, we've got now thousands of insecure home networks. Um, and one of the things that is interesting is when attackers say, I'm going to go steal intellectual property using this person's credentials, pull it down to their home laptop. And then when I see that home laptop not connected to the VPN, but still on, then it'll go and exfiltrate the data out that person's home network because the home network doesn't have the monitoring stuff. So there's no egress monitoring or anything. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting pattern. If you ever see a data pattern that looks like that, that's really, really bad. Um, and just the whole situation with home routers is just absolutely horrible. There's a lot of reports about this, but like typically they're installed. They've been running for five to 10 years. They've never been patched once. They have default passwords, tons of vulnerabilities. They are just Swiss cheese from an attacker's perspective. So all attackers really need to do is they need to send you an email with like a GIF that will basically de-identify where your home IP address is. And then they can start coming directly for your employees that way. Because uh, it gives them the router's IP address. So, I mean, this 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 situation is just disasters. Um, we're also seeing lots of video conferencing scams. Probably you probably heard of these. There was also like the Zoom bombing and stuff where people were just going through and connecting to all the different Zoom connections and, you know, listening. And so basically what they were able to do was to like connect and suddenly be in some of these meetings and then learn how to social engineer people. So they were grabbing a lot of information uh, to basically social engineer companies for phishing and other things. Uh, we've also seen attacks via dating sites, uh, the fake DocuSign document one was wonderful. I mean, it's like effectiveness of an attacker. That thing was amazing. This is also a great one to fish your employees with. Um, and this is easy to replicate because you can just send yourself a DocuSign document, cut and paste the actual image, and then away you go. Um, but the, these types of attacks are, you know, really, in some sense, just getting started. Um, now, SIM jacking is an interesting one. The way we handle security with phones We've, we've, in a lot of cases, put a little too much trust in our phones. And SIM jacking basically allows somebody to clone a copy of your cell phone so that they get a copy of all of the messages and SMS and two-factor authentication that you get. And when that occurs, it breaks the traditional dynamic that we had of being able to text somebody a couple of numbers. And when they text that those couple of numbers, um, you would actually end up having an idea of like, oh, they, they texted these numbers. We can now use these numbers and log in through their VPN connection. Now, when you start using some of the authenticator, you can't see that at all, but like the, when you start using some of the authenticating tools that actually have the program on their phone, that SIM jacking problem goes away. 
Um, unfortunately, there's still tons of companies that just send these, uh, you know, six digit codes to your phone and those can get intercepted. And we've seen that happen for people to steal cryptocurrency from people's other cryptocurrency wallets, um, all sorts of stuff. So um, again, and I'm just kind of profiling lots of different new things that we've seen. Uh, ad extortion. Um, there's a lot of businesses that make 100% of their money from ads, you know, and it could be a blog or any number of things. And some of the dollar amounts are actually pretty high. Um, and we've seen people that are like, you know, we will force Google to shut down your ads because we're going to ransomware you if you don't pay us. Now, these don't tend to pay out really well, but it's like, you know, here's $2,000 or $5,000. And if you don't do it, we're going to shut your business off and you'll have no income. And then you'll have to wrestle with, you know, Google's automated whatever and hope in four weeks you can start a new account or something. Um, but th there's a variety of different changes in these attacks. Um, one thing I also want to point out is distributed denial of service, you know, is getting worse. This is showing you where Amazon and uh, Google were kind of talking about like these massive attacks. This is about to get a whole lot worse because of the law of 4J. Log4j is going to leave us in a situation where we have millions of unpatched devices for a very long period of time, where the people who do distributed denial service attack are going to start grabbing all those access. And it could be little bitty IoT devices. It could be any number of things. Um, because there's millions of devices that have the same vulnerability, this is almost guaranteed to be weaponized for DDoS. It'll be weaponized for like ransomware and other things too. But once the DDoS guys start getting on that, we're going to see some huge record size denial service attacks. Now, you'll notice the second differential of this trend. Things are just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and sites are still getting shut down from this. Um, we have some services, you know, Cloudflare and stuff like that that are very helpful, uh, but they're not perfect. We do sometimes lose sites. And then a lot of times companies, they'll protect their main website, but then they won't protect critical APIs. And the ransomware or the DDoS guys might hit your main website first, but eventually they're going to figure out like, okay, that's got Cloudflare, but these three other assets don't. Let's hit those. And then when they start doing a little bit of the math, they can shut down your manufacturing side. And when that happens, it can really cause problems with certain companies, not all companies. Um, and again, just as an example, this is back from 2016, the DYN cyber attack. Look at all the different companies that went offline from this. Now, this is, you can go to Wikipedia and look at this link. But I mean, this shut down a huge swath of the internet. You know, and you see companies like Visa and stuff like that. Like when you're losing in massive payment systems, this imp these businesses impacted a lot of other businesses when they went down. So this was a, a disastrous one. And, and people still think this was something of a test from a cyber warfare aspect. They were like, you know, somebody just wanted to see how well this worked and it worked incredibly well. Um, so we do have DDoS as a service out there. Um, these are cheap. You can get like as low as $35. You can have somebody DDoS a site. Um, it just depends on how much you want to hit it and you know what you want to do. Um, these aren't as lucrative to attackers or the middlemen as ransomware. Ransomware is the hot one that people have to pay out for. Some companies, DDoS hits you, you're like, yeah, let's wait it out. You know, it's like our website's not used for anything. So it's, you know, no big deal for a week. Uh, it just depends on who you are. Um, if 100% of your business comes from your website, that's a different story. Um, now, another thing, you know, I, I've talked about DDoS and I've talked about ransomware and other thing. One of the big problems that still goes on, this kind of ties back into that insurance question a little bit, is uh, cloud misconfigurations. Um, Again and again and again and again, every single time I do like an AWS or an Azure assessment, it's there's a tax surface open. People didn't realize that databases get open public. There's there's all sorts of things. Um, the S3 bucket problem from Amazon, which was more a user interface problem to me and a default, it's a security default in some ways, um, really rampaged hundreds of companies, like tons of data got taken, credit cards got taken, like all sorts of stuff. There were lots of data breaches because of just misconfiguration. And it was, some of it was from where people thought 
that the cloud was just like VMware. And they had these guys, and they're like, I know VMware, and VMware has these certain defaults. So if I do this exact same thing in the cloud, they think it'll have the same defaults. And it's, no, it totally has totally different defaults. They're way worse, and you just opened your stuff to the internet. So there were a couple of patterns that we would see with companies again and again and again that was just like, oh, that was horrible. Don't, don't do that. Um, now, the biggest thing here is the security tools you have to use to grill your AWS environment and your Azure environment or your Google Cloud environment or Oracle or whatever are very wildly different than what we would have had for a traditional organization. Um, in a lot of companies, the security teams don't know those tools exist. They've never run them. They don't know how to do it. Um, and so they're running with traditional security controls in, with, with your services in the cloud, again, as if it was a VMware environment. They're thinking, oh, yeah, well, I ran such and such and I did a vulnerability scan. We should be good. But, you know, in the back end, it's like wide open and they just don't know. The other thing that I will point out here is um, there's some really bad defaults that are still tied in on all of the major cloud players. Um, some are really, really unfortunate because you can't fix some of the ones. So like there's some in Azure and AWS where like basically when you set up the environment, you have to run a few commands at first before you put anything in that environment. And the problem is, is like if somebody builds out a massive environment, it's got 200 instances and all this stuff, we can't undo that. It's like, well, we're going to start and create a new Amazon account. We're going to fix it there. And then over time, we're going to migrate your 200 machines to that. That having those bad defaults is really, really unfortunate. And it's frequently, you know, I get pulled into companies where it's like, you know, well, yeah, they built all this and then now they got to want to secure it, but they don't realize you can't really undo the damage that was done from certain cases. A lot of it we can fix, but not everything. So having that knowledge before you architect your cloud environment is really, really, really important. But again, cloud misconfigurations, huge swath of problems that are going on out there. Um, and from a ransomware, I'm sorry, from an insurance standpoint, that is another big area that I don't see insurers knowing how to check. I don't see insurers understanding how to assess the cloud environment. I never see them assess the cloud environment itself. They tend to assess the systems and look for traditional controls. And they're usually running it off to a third party provider that's you know scanning it with some basic scans. None of those test any of the backend cloud configuration. Hey, Trey, before you move off the cloud subject, um, Bikram had a earlier question um, on chat. What are the biggest risk factors for companies using 100% third-party cloud native infrastructure? Um, yeah, the biggest one is really comes to the backups and the loss of control. It, it's the incident response and also the... Um, there's there's two pieces is the the incident response component is harder that can be fixed but a lot of people don't know that there's other things you need to do and so there tends to be a knowledge gap i would say the knowledge gap is one of the biggest problems with that but the the second thing that i see again and again and again um and there's been a couple of companies that have literally one was like a competitor to github back in the day and they had like all these companies code on it, they never backed it up off of Amazon. They like 100% of their backups were Glacier. I think that one was a disgruntled employee. They deleted all the Glacier backups. They deleted all the instances. They deleted everything. They deleted all the user accounts and then they closed the account. That company did not recover. They just, you know, repointed their DNS to another website with an apology and said it's over. Um, so there, there, there have been a number of companies that have just literally disappeared because they didn't back their stuff up off the cloud. Um, and this is a fairly easy thing to take care of, but the, one of the problems that we end up having is that, you know, the backups, um, in a lot of sense of the way Amazon backs, Amazon also, or I should say cloud providers in general have some features that would seem to be backups, but they're not backups from a, an attacker getting a new perspective. They're like recent snapshots that we can roll back to, but they're not truly a backup. And if that whole service goes down, you don't have anything. Um, and that is not limited to the cloud providers. The other area that I run into this a lot is SaaS providers. So let's say you use a SaaS provider for 
all of your sales data or a SaaS provider for all of your financial data or all of your HR data, and they lose your data? Uh, how, what does your recovery plan look like? Do you have a copy of that data? Um, I've seen a couple of those go out where none of the customers had the data and they're like, we literally have nothing. We have, we have no idea how much we even pay our customers. They're gone. Like all that information is gone. Um, you know, so understanding how you have um, business continuity plans around that and making sure that you understand what data you don't have access to is really important. Um, and that kind of gets into a large data architecture issue, but that same pattern of throwing all your stuff in one bucket and hoping nothing ever happens to that bucket is the same problem that SaaS providers. It's not limited to cloud. So hopefully that answers the question. Cloud's a big topic too. This is, there's, there's a lot of issues around cloud platform security. All right, thanks, Ray. Go ahead, keep going. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is just like the mixture of things that are happening with artificial intelligence. Um, now we currently have, I did a TV thing for Como, it's actually still online. If you want, if you Google on Como and uh, voice cloning or voice cloning and Trey Blaylock, you can watch that. But it's basically where I took one of the news anchors and recorded her voice. And I only needed five seconds of her voice, which is about the amount from an average like voice message from somebody's cell phone. So like I can get people's voices pretty easily. And then you're basically running that against a large set of data of basically English, English language um, pronunciation uh, database. And then what it does is it says, I've got this voice print, I'm gonna apply it to the English language. And now I can have that person speak in English and say anything I want. And it works flawlessly. It's pretty amazing stuff. You do end up running into some weird things where like the way we pronounce pizza and the way we spell pizza don't match, but you just change the spelling and it ends up working. This, this is free tools you can download off of GitHub, very easy to set up and run. Um, but what this is used for is a mixture of things. So we get ransomware of parents where, you know, we're like, if you don't wire transfer money right now, we're going to kill your kid. And all it is is the kid is hiking and somebody stole a copy of the sample and they replayed it in the child's voice, and the child screaming, help me, help me or whatnot. Um, but we're also seeing where um, CFOs and accountants have been fooled to make basically they watch for when the CEO travels and then they have the CEO's voice call from the CEO's phone number, usually the cell number. So it's caller ID matches too. Um, and then it's that person's voice, that person's caller ID saying, hey, I need you to wire money to this address really fast because we have to finish this transaction before I go on this international flight. That has worked. For a couple of people. Um, so those, those types of attacks are just getting started. Um, and the problem is we are so blind. Like if we hear a voice and it's exactly this person we know, and the person's talking the way we're used to talking, we fall victim to that very easily. Um, because we were like, that's definitely my friend. Like you, cause you know, that voice print. Um, some of those problems are being leveraged by attackers. AI is used by attackers is going to be amazing and horrifying in a lot of different ways. Um, we, we hope for the ones to be funny, but they tend to be pretty bad. Um, this has already been used in politics. I think I've got some of that in here. Um, no, um, but basically there's a lot of different types of ways that this is used. The other thing that AI is used a lot in right now is for uh, fake news, uh, fake news. And then also we've seen it used in elections. Um, there's a, an election in India, which was less harmful. It was basically the guy uh, said, I can speak 24 languages. And they basically took his voice print, ran it with a picture of his face. Like, so he's talking and then they sent it to all 24 languages that are spoken in that region so that he could connect better to all those different people. Problem was he couldn't actually speak all those languages. And so like, there was a lot of you know, issues about like, you know, was it fraudulent that he ended up winning? You know, those kind of things. Hey, Trey, we have uh, five minutes left. Um, so um, we, we do have one last question on chat, if you mind taking it. Um, Mark had asked, what is your opinion on zero trust? Uh, I, so I, my biggest thing with zero trust is the concept of zero trust is great. The use of zero trust in most environments is horrible. Um, I think one of the problems is zero trust. When people realized that that was a good idea, a lot of the marketing for security tools hijacked it and ended up running and saying, oh, no, this is zero trust. And another company's like, no, this is zero trust. And when you start really getting into those environments, 
they're not zero trust. That's the thing that I run into again and again and again when I analyze security tools. The same thing comes back to like the ransomware active directory thing. It's like, okay, they say they've got zero trust, but all these systems are on the AD network and GPO goes to every one of these machines. So they obviously trust each other. Like I can literally start mapping all the trust associations in these areas they say are zero trust. Now, concept wise, it is a brilliant concept that is, Absolutely what we want to do, but it's a very old concept. It comes back to like minimalization of security. It comes back to things we've done for thousands of years with castles and stuff. So it's 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 not a new concept, but I do see marketing kind of misusing the heck out of it. And it doesn't mean that some of these products don't have good features, but you know, there's not a cohesive singular definition. You know, even federal definitions are very different than like, you know, what a lot of the products are being sold for that. So it is a great concept. Um, I, I look to see a lot more in implementation. Um, now that said, I do highly recommend secure enclaves and making lots of little bitty compartmentalized areas using zero trust. That is a huge way to prevent attackers from going from A to B to C to get through to your network. It gives you a lot of time. If you do it right, it's really, really good. The other thing that's a related concept is having one-way firewalls. So you can have an area where, let's say, customers can upload data, and you can have a firewall that never allows any pa packets of anything to ever go in through the network. And then on this side, you're forced to do a pull to grab that and pull it across. Um, you can do the same thing with backups. You can do the same thing with any number of database servers. That is a really great uh, architecture design that's rarely used, but it's extremely powerful. Um, and I highly recommend it to take care of the Active Directory problem. If, if you just, let's say you have a backup server now, just put a one-way firewall and have another system that goes through that and pulls a copy from your current backup server, locks it off or puts it on tape. That's a really good way to defeat the problem with ransomware on AD. So anyway, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, thanks, Trey. Uh, we we'll probably need to wrap up. I know you have a lot more content in there. And... Actually, we're wrapping it up right now. That's okay. pretty much it. I've got a couple of things out here. The, the one thing I wanted to also mention is this screen is showing you the MITRE attack framework being used in MIST. MIST is a free threat intelligence tool. Um, it's an extremely powerful tool. It's a really good way to kind of get your team up to speed with what's going on around you. But the key thing that I wanted to show you is that this is actually making its way into a lot of the tooling. So it makes it makes a lot of the um, defenses a lot more powerful and it gets everybody on the same page when we're talking about security things. Now I talked roughly about some of these ML things. Um, this is not a really big deal and that was pretty much it right there. So, and again, you can go to this URL or hit that uh, QR code and get a copy of the slides or feel free to email me um, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free to ask me any questions if you think of something tomorrow that's relevant to this too. So. Fantastic. Trey, thank you so much. I've, uh, I've, I've walked away with a lot of information. I think that home router is de definitely a time time bomb ready to blow uh, go off so i appreciate that input there um any last questions before we wrap up from anyone i'll just throw one thing out too with that home router one there's a really neat thing called open wrt which allows you to have linux and a bunch of security tools on that so that's like a great way to handle that at your house but i think in the future we may end up having a problem where or that's not a problem but we may end up having remote workers where we help provide additional like firewalling or router services for some of the customers and employees and additional training. Um, and I, I think the future of remote work is gonna look a lot different than it currently works. Looks, looks like from a security perspective. So Absolutely. just on that same note. So, but open Thanks, Dre. Great. So. Thanks, I really appreciate it again, uh, sharing your uh, presentation to um, the folks here tonight. Um, Richard or uh, Richard, do you have any final comments before we uh, let everyone go? Uh, nope, I think we're good. Unless there's any other, uh, I did most of my announcements at the beginning. But uh, th thanks again to the speaker, Trey. It was uh, great. Yeah, no, I've been taking notes. <laughs> got, I got I got some questions to ask my security team this week. Uh, <laughs> this week's security meeting, that's for sure. Yep. But thanks, Trey. Um, thanks, Jordan. And thank uh, you. Uh, 
we will we can formally close tonight's meeting if people want to stay on and chat and if, and if Trey can stay on a little bit later yeah I can. Um, and take some questions we can just leave it in an open format but I, I do want to give people respect people's time thanks Jordan and and officially close the evening but we can keep chatting if people want, would like to any more questions for me I guess I'm um, I my one would be, and I think you touched on it a little bit, and, I, and I'm certainly getting more feedback around, um, we met with our security folks today around a compliance approach versus a risk assessment approach. So yeah. as a CIO, I struggle with the fact that I have very limited resources. So what resources I have, I really need to apply to where I'm going to get the maximum uh, benefit. You know, we can certainly secure, actually my, my boss gave me a great example today. She was... Um, saying around, you know, securing all of our devices um, versus, you know, the network protection. If the device is sitting in somebody's desk somewhere, um, it's not a threat. Now, when it's plugged into the network again, it might be a threat. But if we've got network access control, it can block that machine until it gets patched, that kind of approach. Um, but it's, you know, being a little bit more intelligent in how we approach these things and, and what kind of framework we can use to do that. Yeah, there, there's a couple of problems where the compliance market and real world security have started to diverge a bit. And so like, like the example I gave with cloud security, like there's a lot of the compliance, you know, there's a handful of things here that deal with the cloud, but they don't deal with like the exact attack surface or these exact, you know, like services that we're using. And so like, it's easy to check these boxes, but you didn't actually secure this other weird thing. The, the tricky thing is like, how do you get an out of date uh, compliance system to map to what you need to do security wise? And, and the thing that I do is I end up kind of architecting like, what does the real world security of this look like and then based on that, can I start pulling what maps to my controls rather than driving with the controls and trying to pull the architecture around? Because I think when, when, when you drive with the controls first, you're driving sometimes with a dated architecture and then it, it limits and makes it really painful if you're using Kubernetes or cloud or any number of things to map this into that other architecture. Whereas if you say, Let's do it the other way. Let's see, like, what is the best route security wise? And then let me pull these things across. The two results end up having very different listings of controls at the end. And I find that if you prioritize the security first, which unfortunately a lot of times is not the one that gets budgeted first, compliance gets budgeted first. And so the driving back and forth of those gets tricky. Um, but if you if you if you look at that, and then also I, I recommend considering when the controls were designed and when the questions for that particular compliance framework. Compliance frameworks also have like some look different in different times. Like PCI looks very different than SOX and looks very different than HIPAA. Um, and, and so in what you can do, like how easy it is to wiggle around with cloud or Kubernetes or any number of different services is easier in some frameworks than other frameworks. Um, but, but I find that the, the biggest thing is one, also lowering your cost. Like one of the biggest mistakes I see defenders do is they build security that gets really expensive at scale. And that doesn't work. Like if you look at like Google and some of the larger organizations that really do scaling, um, there's a lot of things that on scaling they don't they fail. If you if you did your economics wrong, the second curve of the derivative goes up forever, and it basically is like if our business gets ten times larger, it's going to cost us more than the entire company makes to secure this thing. Um, and, and an analogy I also have is like when you put security in, you, we want to shift left. But one of the analogies I have is if you were to build a skyscraper and not put plumbing in it, and you said, I'm never, I'm not getting city permits. I'm not going to, you know, connect under the road. I'm not going to do all this under the pavement. I'm going to build the entire thing, put in wallpaper, carpet, all these different rooms, no plumbing anywhere. And then at the end, you want to add plumbing. That's an extremely expensive thing because you've now got to jackhammer everything. You've got to go get rid of some of these rooms that you've sold possibly to other customers. You know, are you going to add it on the outside of the skyscraper? Like, what, what is your plan here? Um, so security is really, really, really important economically to get security in first in the architecture. If you can get 
security economics prioritized in the architecture, that will save you in the long run. The other thing that's a really weird problem is people are used to, one, we think naturally in more linear terms of numbers. And so exponential numbers don't really work really well with people. But the other thing is IT doesn't scale up as quickly in cost as security. And so we're like, well, the IT cost might look like this, but the security costs when you get up are going to look like that. And when you aren't doing that bit of math while you're doing the discussions, it ends up creating a, uh, a huge problem down the road for your company. And so like literally you want to figure out like how do we make the long-term cost of this as low as possible? If you can keep that in mind at your architecture standpoint, everything gets a lot easier. The other plus is suddenly your board trusts you more because they see that you're trying to save them money. You're trying to do all this stuff. If they can get the whole long-term picture and see why you're doing this stuff and how you're saving the money, you get a lot more money turned on so you can actually do more security projects. So that tends to be a really good win right. win. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the biggest way. I, I don't view compliance in a negative light. I just feel like we don't necessarily bring it up to speed the way that we should. And I think that, that that gap in time is killing us much more than compliance itself. It's just the gap. And if you can if you can get that gap to where compliance is on the same page as some of the modern tools, the modern security architecture, then it's not a problem at all. Um, in fact, then you've got both right. people working towards the same goal. So, yeah. Right. Hey, Thanks. hey, Trey. Uh, Hey, Trey, I wonder if, if I was trying to explain to my students why that home network is a risk to the organization in two minutes, or maybe some uh, the people, other people on the call need to explain it to their uh, to someone else in the organization. Can you can you walk through in a quick way? I know the analogies. Oh, well, it's kind of, but can you can you kind of walk through a line to see why that's really a risk in just a minute? I would create a graph. I'll just show you one real quick. That looks like this and it just shows the number of CVEs increasing over 10 years and find all the CVS or CVSS 10s and just show that that number goes crazy because people don't patch it over time because it's really this is the problem you know so what now, you're getting at is the, the the person's computer at home probably isn't patched so that's what you're worried about no, no, you're no, not no, no. it's the router the router's not patched yeah, but let's say they compromise the router. How does that really threaten the, uh, the, the enterprise? They can intercept all the DNS connections and change every server that you're going to on the back end. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't realize you were wanting that from the attack perspective. Yeah, so that, that, that's one of the things that they can do. Um, the other thing is they kind of can do flow control and start access. They can figure out like, one, if you've got any kind of cookies that aren't secured, they can get copies of those, use those for permission. But they can actually use that as a Linux standpoint for Metasploit. So it can actually use Meterpreter on that device to then attack you locally. And then you've got no trace that that's going on. So it it's, makes it one hop because those are Linux boxes. You know, in pretty much every case, they're a Linux box. Um, and they just tend to be old ones that the company is cheaping out on and not patching and it causes problems. It's not a fault of Linux. It's just the fact that it's the lack of maintenance. It's, you know, those companies designed to throw it away and never think about it. And they don't want to patch. Thank you. So, yeah. Well, think of me geeky, but I'm actually running and I have been running Merlin on all of my routers. So I wipe the, <laughs> the default OS out and I'm just running proprietary stuff. Yeah. The, the thing is, I wish it was easy for everybody to do. I wish like, people would sell open, uh, basically routers that are just like dead easy, you know, like it ships and it's got something as easy as Ubuntu yeah. or something. Like that. Um, they, they don't necessarily make it easy and they're still fighting that business model. But I think if there was a really good router vendor that just made it super easy, like for the people who know to do it, it is easy. Cause like once you've done it once, you're like, oh yeah, that's no big deal. It's just yeah. flash this image and then reboot and change my IP and we're good. Um, but for the people who've never done that, it sounds like it's just, incredibly hard um and i really wish we would get towards making that a lot easier for people and, and yeah. also in general a lot of stuff with security is how can we make the security easier in general for it because if we can make getting data easier if we can make 
visualizing the problems easier, a lot of times the problems themselves will go away. Like if you can really diagram well why your development team is doing something crazy and you can give them a really good visual diagram, they'll fix it, you know? But if you don't do that visual thing and you're just trying to talk to them, they're like, yeah, we're not sure that that's actually a problem. <laughs> so so, so the, the understanding of why these problems exist is really important. So communication is huge when you're trying to train your developers, train your end users, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, you know, and that's, that's we, we all know, that I think there's a gap in security awareness where security awareness also has a time problem where some of the older security awareness stuff is really, down talking to the users and it's really kind of like not assuming they're technical or anything and it's tricky to have that gap between too technical and not technical enough um, and i think we could do better in those areas um, and i think that that could make a lot of our organization stronger so 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 you're, you're saying that we all should uh, log into our routers and and uh, bring them up today How yeah you? Or just wipe it and put a new OS on it, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there is another thing you could do. It's not quite as good, but you can actually get a firewall that's a separate device and put it in between. But that, that works better with a wired network. But the way to do it, if you don't, is run a wired network from the router to that firewall and then only use that firewall for your wireless. Now, a thing you can also do with that is then you have two wireless networks, which one causes a problem with interference unless you figure out that they're on the different frequencies and different bands, but it would allow you to have a guest network that's on your unsecured side as opposed to your secured side, which would be on your firewall. So okay. there are other ways to handle this problem. Nonetheless, you really want to remove that out-of-date operating system off that device, even if you do the firewall. You still want to get rid of that. It's so. it's on my roadmap. It's on my roadmap to bundle a home VPN device so that people have a hardware VPN and they only plug their work PC into that. Yeah. Right. And then I control that security. So if their home network is a mess, their PC is still cordoned off from it. And that that sounds complicated, but it's actually a big help for the users. <laughs> Yeah. There's so many, so many performance problems and other things that we get more visibility if we have a device out there we control. Yeah, I think the trick there is where do you draw the line with privacy? And, you know, if you can get users trained to like use your personal computer on your own personal network separate from the company on the company's network. If you can train them to do that so that they're not doing their personal stuff on your computer and vice versa, that'll eliminate the privacy issue, but you end up running into a privacy issue where maybe you have employees that are on a dating site or they're doing whatever, video game, any number of things. If they're using what ends up being the corporate network, that creates a different problem. And suddenly you're introducing toxic data into logs, you're introducing all sorts of other problems that you don't wanna have. So, um, but yeah, if you can keep them cleanly separated, that is the best way in the world to handle but Yeah, the, the solution there is just to make sure that that traffic doesn't flow to the corporate network to and from, so. Yeah, the, the catch there just being, it just depends on how many employees you have and cost effectiveness. But that is definitely the best way to do it. I, I mean, let's imagine spending a thousand dollars a user on that solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is a, what is the typical cost of a breach? The, yeah. the math is the math is really good, right? And that's honestly, home networks are one of the one of the things that keep me up at night for sure. So mm -hmm. to me, doubling the cost of their laptop equipment is not a big deal. It's kind of a no brainer. Yeah, there's also some other things. There's some other tricks that we can do with a mixture of DNS security and VPN configuration security, um, as well as with flow analysis and stuff on the back end of the network. But there, there's a lot more that we can do to help secure that endpoint device. And then we can also do stuff where we make sure that that device doesn't egress data out in any other directions. So there, there are additional security controls we can put on the equipment we have now that's just not what people typically do. Right, um, well, and the, where we sit today, and this is fairly effective, it's just having that piece of hardware out there gives us some other flexibility that we want. But where we sit today is that the VPN client comes up and blocks access to the network except connection to our VPN gateways. So our users don't have any internet when they're in their home office until they connect to VPN. And then all that traffic goes through the corporate network 
and we control what they have access to. Which, gotcha. Again, it sounds really restrictive, but it doesn't take very much ex explanation to the end users to say, look, we don't care what you do on your home network and you know right. how you use your work PC. We're, we're not trying to be the, the police. We're not inspecting every place you go to to see if you're ever checking personal email. We're just blocking the stuff that that we think is a risk to the to the company. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of really good stuff that you can do around that. Um, and the, the catch comes back to like, you know, and another thing also is having APT uh, software specific. Um, so this is a, a larger conversation, but the APT endpoint software you use is really, 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 really important on those end devices. Um, but there's a lot that people need to know about how those tools do work and don't work. And the other thing is that you need to know how those APT tools can be disabled. Because um, some of the advanced attackers have figured out like, okay, you're running this particular tool. The first thing we do when we get on your system is run this command line that disables that. Um, so, it, it, but there's tricks that you can do so that that's not the right command path. And so if they ran the default command, it wouldn't work. It would actually alert you. There's, there's some neat tricks you can do on that security wise. Um, the problem ends up becoming, we end up having this problem where a lot of those APT tools are using machine learning and they want to gather large parts of data off of your systems, off of your network traffic and send them off to a third party. Um, if you have unlimited bandwidth and unlimited money, this isn't a problem, but when you have a very large workforce, it can become a very expensive opportunity or expensive thing uh, to deal with. Uh, just the, the, load, the additional load that sending all that data to a third party provides. Um, the newer APT tools are very different than our traditional antivirus in that sense. And they're sending a lot more data back to these third parties. Um, likewise, um, you know, the, this came up in la the last election, presidential election, um, you know, which partner you're using and what country they're in is starting to become a, a very big issue too. So when you're choosing those APT tools, there's a lot to think about, uh, like who you're partnering with. So again, that's a huge discussion. So. Do you have any particular recommendations? So stand, uh, I know we talked about zero trust, right? But another big thing is uh, open source in general. Right, because there is no one guy you can just call at two o'clock in the morning saying everything is uh, just blown into my face at you know a big corporation, right? Yeah. Uh, so, what are your thoughts in general about the current state of open source uh, overall, right? For more mature products than less, right? And then, secondly, what is the future of uh, open source, uh, like in the large enterprises? Yeah. Um, so two things. Um, one thing that we're not doing a really good job of right now is grabbing GitHub repositories from all of our supply chain. So let's say you're making a software product and you have 400 pieces of open source that go compiled into that. Um, generally, when you're running your source code analysis, you're only doing it on your own code. So my suggestion is you need to do it on those 400 and then provide it back. Now, GitHub specifically has started doing a little bit of that and providing some of that information to their users. They also have a security team that's kind of looking around for certain, you know, like you just uploaded your root key, don't do that kind of things. Um, but we're not doing it at the supply chain level of analysis that we need to be doing. And we need to be working with both our third party suppliers, but then also all these open source products to see what else is going into our code. And then more importantly, like, let's say, like, if I scan it today, I don't see anything, but a new technique for analyzing and finding a security code comes out in Java or something tomorrow. Are you going back and reanalyzing all those 400 GitHub projects to see where that exists in your environment? And currently, nobody's doing that. And that ends up being a problem. Now, there's a two-way street here that's kind of like, unspoken is large companies can do that and they can analyze all the GitHub repositories they want, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything's going to get fixed unless they start contributing back to the open source companies. Now, immediately, one of the things you can contribute if you have some of this expensive software, because uh, some of the source code analysis tools, there's some good free ones, but they're depending on the language and the library, sometimes you end up having to buy these really expensive ones. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Now, if you're just running stock Python or something, the free ones are better than the commercial ones. So it just depends on what you're doing. But you're going to run into situations where you the free ones aren't going to cut it. And you're going to need some of these. If you're running stuff like that, and you can say like that license for that software is 50 grand a seat. Well, the open source guy who's developing that code for you, he doesn't have 50 grand to blow on it. You could send him a copy of your report and say, hey, I've noticed that we've found these things and just start checking that in for him. You're basically giving him visibility and power to protect you. And so we need to start having more two-way relationships with our suppliers and our supply chain, including back into the open source environments. So there, there's a lot we could do to make the world better in that sense by helping other people write code better and finding these problems. So it, it's a big topic though, but, but, but like I said, having an analysis of the capability to scan all of those- you have a quick question? That's a huge tool in your tool bag if you've got it. And it's free. Mm-hmm. You have a question? So it's like, yeah. You might as well take- $50.66. For all the, how many printers? Oh, yes, so that's about that. So I, I think there is a, a good chance that we'll have um, automated, uh, like AI-driven uh, security validation tools show up. As it's, I think that's uh, the, the last slides, probably going to happen. The last slides in that presentation that I had to skip through was me talking about how those don't work. So <laughs> there's some really good things. Now, AI, AI is this wonderful set of technologies. I absolutely love, but I also absolutely hate them at the same time. Because one of the things it does is like, there's a lot of stuff we can't do security wise because we don't have the manpower. It would take 80 guys to look at all of the logs of everything in a large company. We just literally don't have that many people. AI can solve this by looking for known things. It is scale five cents a piece. Can't even see. So AI is wonderful for some of this stuff. But there's this line where if you as a security person don't know where the edges of that AI software have you're not going to realize there's gaps in what you're checking. And so the attackers are realizing this is what this is. That's that's a good price. And they're basically figuring out where this difference is so that they can attack without your defenses being able to to detect it. And this started, there's a really good DEF CON talk, I want to say 2016, where they first started attacking machine learning security tools. They said, we're going to have machine learning defenses and we're now going to start attacking it. We're also seeing regression analysis in some of the large um, attack tools that are attacking the entire. So there's all these tools that scan the entire IP internet. Uh, if you go to ZMAP, Z-M-A-P dot I-O, you'll see this entire toolkit that can scan all of, basically touch and get a response from every machine on the IP4 internet in five minutes, assuming you've got giant bandwidth the server. Now, people are weaponizing that and adding tools on top of ZMAP so that they can attack all of the IP4 internet. And they're doing it for large sections of the IP6 internet. And if you're smart about the way you scan, you can scan the IP6 internet a lot easier than people think of what's relevant from your targets, what you're trying to attack. But weaponizing that stuff at scale is, is, a, is a huge problem. The tools are completely free right now. But one of the things that's happening is some of these advanced APTs, we see it and we think it's China in this particular case. They're using regression analysis in their attack tools to test all the defenses on every IP address on the internet. And so we're watching what it's basically doing is it's learning how to attack every IP's defenses and getting a little bit of information about like what intrusion detection systems they have, what WAF they have. Now, some of this is very easy to see, but some of the advanced defensive tools, it's harder to see. And that's what they're trying to get into is like, can we use machine learning as an attack tool to attack the planet? Um, And that is really scary at a lot of levels. If you start looking at like a nation state weapon where I say, I want to attack everything in this other country, and then 24 hours later, delete every, like, blow up the firmware of everything I got into, that's a very heavy weapon. So, you know, it's, 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 machine learning is both good and bad. It's just like a knife. You can use it for cooking wonderful food, but it could be something horrible too. Um, But the biggest thing that I run into is a lot of the security people, they don't understand what the edges of machine learning defenses look like. And because they don't know, 
they rarely put defense in depth behind it. And that's where I worry about where those tools get deployed. There's no argument with me that they're wonderful tools. They are huge time-saving tools. The problem is how we're deploying them. So hopefully that answers your question. So without staring too much, but yeah, unfortunately I didn't have enough time to go through too much of that. That's also something I could end up making into an entire talk because it's, it's a big subject. So, but uh, ML is very, very, very powerful. I think people are still underestimating some of the powerful aspects of it um, and where it could save us time. So anything else? I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, we, we recently had a client get scammed out of like a very large amount of money. Um, and I don't even know what the attack is called. I'm wondering if you have a name for it. Um, we basically, we, we sent out an invoice as we often do end of the month on a Friday. Somehow over the weekend, a copy of that email got out in the world. We, we still don't know how. We have two-factor authentication. The, all the logs show that the email was only accessed sort of from on-prem. Um, the hacker took a copy of that email. The speaker tonight is so exciting that uh, it's half an hour and people are still asking questions. Yeah, I think we're here in, here in Sim Portland. Um, they, they, they basically spun up a domain that looked kind of like our domain, inserted themselves into the conversation, and then asked for ACH information. We were looped out at that point. So it's super frustrating because we can't protect against it. But um, I've seen this happen a couple of times in the Seattle area, actually. I've, had, I've been called in, and in certain cases also where FBI gets called in as well. Yeah. Do you know um, what that's called? Is it just... Is it like domain impersonation attack or? Uh, so there's a great tool. Um, there's a great tool to protect you from domain impersonation. In fact, we this use, like we use Mimecast internally. So Mimecast will protect us if it happens in reverse. But yeah, this thing's totally free. This is, uh, so there's a tool called DNS. I'll write it in the chat. It's uh, DNS twist. Um, and I, I don't think I have, I'm trying to think if I have a, a sample of it public but I can show you, let me check a website real quick. Cause if I show you this, it might make more sense. But basically it, it analyzes all of the, um, the, uh, let me see if I do this. okay. Um, basically what it does is it goes through and creates all these off by one bit uh, shifting, all these different changes and it uses all the common words. The most important piece it does is it does most common substitutions that are not visible to humans who are actually looking at the screen. So right, like they change our L's to I's. Yeah, exactly. Those. So this tool prioritizes those first and it comes out with like, these are the top 400 lookalike domains. What I end up doing is I scan a reverse DNS check to see if any of those have been registered one. So registered is like, Hey, let's look at this. This somebody's registered a domain that looks just like ours, except for the I is a one or whatever. Um, but the second thing you want to see is, is there an MX record? And you want the date that that MX record came online, because that's the moment they're going to start sending email. Now that said, that's great. You can see when the attackers are coming. You can see what they're doing. A better use for this is I use that and I actually create all these uh, DNS blocking tools. And so I use DNS security to say, if somebody mistypes GitHub, they're never going to get to GitHub. They're, they're going to go to this wall of 127.001 or some other site that I've got. If somebody mistypes our domain name, they're not going to go send a copy of that data off to this other company. Um, you can also block all incoming email to all of your employees from fake lookalike domains. Uh, now, the same thing you can do, you can do it to your biggest partners. So like, let's say you have 27 large partners that these are like the most critical to your business operations. You can go and run DNS twist across all and come up with 400 simulations of their domains. You can also tell them like, so like I, I did this, I, I used to have CISO one-on-ones when I was uh, working at Coinstar and I was basically talking to CISO, some of our key vendors. And I was basically explaining you need to know to look for this because these attackers that are doing phishing are going to do this to you. And so I would show them like, this is what the tool is. This is what you need to run. This is what you need to block. But I was also telling them, you need to block Coinstar lookalikes so that nobody sends you an email looking like it came from us. And so that was the exact same thing. That tool is free. And all those blocks that I mentioned about putting DNS are free. 
Um, the catch being you got to own your own DNS. That gets a little weirder when you are on AWS and Azure. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend running your own DNS in those environments, even though like when you're starting, maybe not because you're just bootstrapping. But once you get that going, the power of doing DNS filtering, um, it can block off, I think it's 10 to 15 percent of attacks right off the bat, like won't even work because you've got that blocking in place. And then a lot of the uh, command and control where they're doing quick DNS changes, you can block a lot of those types of things with DNS security tools too. Um, there is also a tool that I use called Pi-hole. Yeah. Actually, there's a, uh, one of the few videos I have online. Uh, it's not on YouTube, but it's on the Verification Labs website. I end up showing people how to set this up. I'm gonna throw this in the chat as well. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing you want. It's also something you can train your employees to use. This is super easy to set up. It's like 30 bucks, but you can run that same software, the same back end on a huge Linux box or on a VM. Um, and it can scale to just, you know, billions, if not trillions of DNS queries a second, if you need to. The cool thing about this project is it ties into blacklists from like, I think nine of the major blacklist providers, and it gets pretty much close to real-time updates so that if any known malware or known attackers or fishers, people doing phishing attacks are out there, it'll automatically block all those emails from coming in or from you connecting out to any of these bad IP addresses. So it's, it just automatically blocks a lot of malware. The coolest thing about this, it runs on a Raspberry Pi. So for like 30, 40 bucks, you got this thing running at home. So yeah, it's, and, it's, and I actually it's, even uh, make the uh, partitions like all the uh, partitions read only. So you, there is no way anybody can alter that stuff. If it reboots, it comes up clean yeah. and it only connects to the file server yeah, and like, kind of refer. Yeah, refer and you just firewall it off as an internal. Yep. You can also do it with split DNS. You can have one of these or a pair for internal and a pair for external. Um, but that comes back to how like you do VPN, DNS, that kind of thing. So, exactly. Um, extremely cool and it's free. Um, and, and it's also, I think it's Google, Cloudflare, IBM. It's like all these big... Uh, security information aggregators that are actually contributing into that product. So like when you're using this free piece of software on a $40 piece of device, you're getting, you know, millions of dollars of security in effect from that. So awesome. very cool. But you, like I said, um, use DNS twist, put those in as blocks in your own DNS server. It's a great way to solve a lot of these problems. Um, also, if you have kids that go to sites you want to block, you can do that too. <laughs> so, <Yep>. You know, <laughs> you got it. And, and there are a huge on GitHub even. You can download lists of like known DNS classes for Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or porn or whatever, and you can just grab these lists and block them. So. Um. The, the other thing, this ties into that tool, MISP, M -I -S -P, the threat intelligence product. Um, you, I use MISP to grab a lot of information about um, hashes for malware, but also DNS. And so like, if anybody sees some like, hey, there's like these 10 sites that are attacking the world and it's bad, they'll pass that DNS information into MISP. If you're there, you can grab it or automate it to go and block itself automatically. So if somebody sets up an alert and says, hey, we're seeing attacks from these guys, just automatically block it. So you can link some of that threat intelligence into these tools. In theory, Cloudflare, IBM, those groups are doing that for you, but you can do it a little faster if you have missed. Um, that's one thing that's kind of weird about the threat intelligence industry is nobody has a monopoly on where that stuff gets posted first. So it might be posted on Reddit first. It might be in an email chain. It might be through MISP or any number of things. So you end up having to watch a bunch of different things to figure out those sources. If you learn automation, and you start doing a little bit of Python, sometimes one-liners can start taking that stuff from like these GitHub repositories and auto-blocking it in DNS. Um, but a preventative thing is, we all know this is gonna happen. People are gonna fish you and they're gonna create domains. They're gonna go register domains that look like yours. If you don't- well, know about our, our side of it, like, like I have Mimecast and it does an awesome job of, of you know, filtering out newly spun up domains or, or names that look like employees or whatever. And, um, we use a Palo Alto firewall. It does a really good job of blocking, you know, uh, current threats. But it's like like Byron was saying, when it's your customer's problem, it's it's really tricky. 
Yeah. And that's, you know, again, if it, it, part of this is how much control do you want to have of it? And I, I think having the control and the ability to do that is really useful. Um, yeah, point. And I think having DNS twist is really helpful in that as well. Um, you know, and this gets back into the conversation about endpoint protection, like, you know, do you want to protect your employees, you know, at their homes? Do you want them to have a copy of something like this to protect them for their regular surfing? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of issues, but DNS security is a, the, the cost effectiveness is so awesome because it mm-hmm. costs nothing to do these protections. And if that cuts 10 to 15% of your tax off and it costs nothing, we're all crazy not to do it. So it's, it's, it's really useful. And it's fun to have that at home because you, you'd just be shocked at how many DNS lookups you do in your house on a regular day. Like, I mean, it, it'll be like thousands more than you expect per week. It's um, so it's, it's really useful. So, so. All right. Cool. Really okay. appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank cool. you. And thank you all for joining. Uh, have a good day.